all of you who have joined us by Facebook and YouTube. Welcome, Williams Boulevard Baptist Church. If you have joined us and are not part of a church family, but you have somehow found your way to us, we're thankful that you are with us this morning. Would you, wherever you are, sitting, standing, reclining, whatever you choose, would you worship with us this morning as we celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ? Say it with me. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I want to give a shout out this morning to Kim Lansing, um, our Facebook meme queen. Here's what one of her memes said. Not even sure what day it is anymore. 
it feels like it may be at least April 94th. Well, Kim, I want to tell you this morning that when you forget what day it is, you just remember this is the day the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm so thankful that you joined us for worship this morning. Um, church family, if you are a guest, we're glad you found us. Maybe somebody invited you. Maybe you found us just scrolling through. But we want you to know that we're thankful that you're worshiping with us. And we also believe that God has a word for you today. And so open your heart, worship the Lord, and see what God would say to you this morning. Uh, take a few moments to greet one another. Uh, let us know how you're doing. Chat with each other. Give some emojis. And let's worship the Lord together. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you today for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for your presence in this place. And may our worship be pleasing to you. May we lift up the name of Jesus above all other names. And Father, speak to our hearts. Give us a word from you. Help us to know what it is that you desire from us today and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship together.
I hope that's what you found as you follow the Lord Jesus, that through the difficulties, his grace is always enough. Continue to worship with us this morning.
Jesus is many things to us. He's our Savior. He's our Redeemer. He's our Deliverer. But what amazing thing to know that He's our friend and He'll never leave us or forsake us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and just right in your home, right where you are, just join me in a time of prayer. And I want us to pray and talk to the Lord. I want us to pray and talk to the one who is our friend and just ask Him to speak to our hearts this morning. Father God, we come before you in this place. And we ask that you would teach us how to listen, how to trust the one who is our friend, how to walk in the way of Christ, knowing that he will always be with us, never leave us or forsake us. Teach us, Father, to pray. Teach us to know how to hear from you. Know what to pray for. And how to walk in a way that honors you in this world that we live in. And God, I pray for every person that hears this message. That if their heart would be open, that you would give them a word this morning. That you would speak to them in a unique and special way. That they would know that that was a word from God for me. Thank you for being our friend in this time of trouble. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, church family, I'm glad that you're worshiping with us this morning. And um, I thought we'd kind of take a, a step back to what we've been doing in the past, and that is our congregational question. Uh, we haven't done one of those in a while. And, and so the congregational question this morning that I want us to talk about with each other is this. What have I enjoyed most about the shelter in place? You know, we talk a lot about what we miss and, and what we're missing out on, but, but there's also been some good things. And so I want you to think for just a moment one thing that you've enjoyed the most. And if you're there with your family, um, as you think of it, I want you to share with one another. If you're by yourself, maybe uh, type in a comment on Facebook or text somebody. But I want you to answer the question, what is something that you're enjoying the most about this shelter in place? So take about 30 seconds and have that conversation with each other. A lot of different answers I've heard this week. Um, some people have enjoyed the walks. Um, some people have enjoyed the bike rides. If you've got a bike, because if you don't, there's not one to be found. You can't buy one anywhere in our city, hardly. Um, some have enjoyed the cooking. Um, some of us have gained 10 or 15 pounds from all of this good eating and um, cooking at home and cooking desserts and baking and, and that's been an enjoyable thing for some. And some of you just enjoy time with family and your life is kind of crazy and, and in the routine of life you don't get an opportunity to sit with your family and um, you've enjoyed that. And even many of those who are working pretty hard during this time of crisis, they're coming home in the evening and they're, they're at home every evening and it's an opportunity to be with family and, and just that time for that extra cup of coffee. Uh, you know, sometimes we grab our coffee and we're going, um, but in this time maybe you've had a chance to have four or five or six extra cups in the morning and I hope that you've enjoyed that time. Um, but you know, we're making plans to get back together again, get back to work, and I'm looking forward to our church being able to gather in person again, hopefully sometime in May, and we'll probably have to ease back into the routine, smaller numbers at first. Um, our plan at this point is to stay online because we know that many people won't be able to come right back to church, and also because we're touching a lot of people outside of our circle people in other places, people in other countries. 
I know my good friend Emmanuel Jonah in Liberia. He and Winty regularly join us for our worship service. And that's just an amazing thing um, to be able to share worship together in that way. But as we move back into it, we're going to keep our online and we'll probably have multiple services and we'll have that opportunity to get back together. But in the meantime, it's a good opportunity for us as a church because it gives us an opportunity to reconfigure, um, to reboot, to restart. You know, when your computer's kind of slow and messing up, um, you, you turn it off and you restart it in hopes that it'll, it'll reset itself. And, and I would encourage you in these next several weeks especially, begin thinking about that reset, that reboot, uh, restarting, and, and how is it going to be different? Uh, last Sunday we talked about Jesus being the way, that Jesus is our way to eternal life. Uh, he's the gate, he's the door. And so we enter into the way through Jesus Christ. But the challenge is not just the entry. That is a gift of grace. That is something that God gives us by his mercy and grace. But once we enter, there is a way in which God intends for us to walk. And I want to begin these next few weeks talking about that way, rediscovering what it is to have that walk with the Lord. Um, some of you have shared with me in the last couple of weeks that this has been a good, refreshing time. You've been able to rediscover that walk with the Lord. Your walk with God had become stale. And so I hope you're taking advantage of that. I want you to think about things like, what, what have you gained that's worth keeping? What are you doing right now? that you want to make sure you're doing after this is all over and we've readjusted back into our normal life. But then there's some other things that, that, that you've lost, but they aren't worth reacquiring. Uh, maybe some of the things that you did that were, were time wasters, things that didn't bring value to your life, things that took away from your family. And so how are you going to avoid going back into those same things, falling back into the same trap? What are the things that you've lost that you're going to say, I'm not taking back that because I want to have a healthy walk with the Lord? If you have your Bibles, I want you to open to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Um, first five books in the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I want to look at Deuteronomy chapter 6 for our passage this morning. And before I read it, I want to tell you just a little bit about the context. So the Israelites were slaves in Egypt for 400 years. And Moses led them out of Egypt and, and led them towards the promised land. But on the way to the promised land, God allowed them to be in a wilderness for 40 years. Many different reasons for that, but they were in the wilderness. And now they're at the point of coming out of the wilderness into the promised land. So if you feel like the isolation is a wilderness, this message is applicable for you. They have been in isolation. They have been on hold. They know where they're going, but they can't go back yet. And now it's about finally time to do that. And so they're about to enter in. But in that wilderness, in that isolation, it wasn't just a time of sitting and waiting. God was doing some things in their life. This is when God gave them the tabernacle. Um, the temple eventually came out of the establishment of the tabernacle. God gave them the Ten Commandments. We're very familiar with the Ten Commandments. Well, God gave that to them while they were in the wilderness. I need you to understand, church family, that while you're in isolation, while you're going through this time of uncertainty, God can give you some things in a unique and special way. And so the commandments and the laws and the, the ways of God that he wanted the people to follow, he was giving that to them in preparation for taking them into the promised land. So let me read one of those passages, Deuteronomy chapter 6, and I'll start in verse 3. It says, Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly. As the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised to you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. 
and these words that I command you today should be on your heart. May God bless the reading of the word. Now, as you have time today, I want you to go back and read the rest of Deuteronomy chapter 6. There's much more, but I want to focus on this one part that is basically a springboard to all the other parts. Uh, we refer to this particular passage, one of the most important passages in the Old Testament, as the Shema. We actually see it quoted later on in the New Testament, but it's called the Shema, and it, it's like a prayer. Um, the word itself to hear means Shema, but the whole thing is the Shema because it's a prayer. It's something that the people uh, recited or said on a regular basis. And God had given them these words. It's kind of like sometimes on Sunday when I say to you, God is good, what do you say? All the time. All the time on, and all the time, God is good. And it's a repetition of that. Um, we are repeating that, not just because of the repetition, but because we want to be reminded that God is good. And, and, and even on our bad days, God is good. And when you're laying in the bed and you're sick and, and you don't know what's going to happen, you can know that God is still good even in those times. And so we repeat that quite often to remind us, to anchor us and teach us. This is that type of passage. This is something that the Israelites regularly repeated. They repeated in the temple. They repeated in the tabernacle. They repeated in gatherings. They repeated in their home because it was a part of their understanding of who God is. And so when it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That would be something that they would repeat over and over now, one of the resources that you have at your disposal, I know some of y'all are burning up Netflix and um, you've used up all the content of Netflix, but there's some other material out there too and I want to point you towards it. Um, right Now Media. Uh, we as a church provide to our church family Right Now Media and it's like the Christian Netflix. It has about 5,000 or more videos on it and um, the, you, it's free to you. Um, but to sign up, you've got to send us your email, either through our Connect um, page on the website or, or just through instant message on, on our church web, um, Facebook page or, or just any of our staff. You can give us your email and we'll get you signed up. And you have access to all the material. It has material about marriage, about children, about various books of the Bible. It's a great tool. But in the Right Now Media, there's also a place where they give us an opportunity to have our own channel. And so if you were to go to the library, you would see one that says Williams Boulevard Baptist Church. And we regularly put things like our worship service in there for you to have access through Right Now Media. One of the things I dropped in there is, is a little animated video clip. It's about three and a half minutes, and it's on the Shema. And so here's your homework assignment. I know you weren't expecting homework assignment on Sunday morning, um, but I'm giving you a homework assignment uh, for you and your family to watch that three-minute video sometime this week. And it's teaching you about the Shema. It's teaching you about this particular passage and about the Word of God. And I hope you'll go back and watch that. But the Shema means to hear um, and, and to listen. And so I was thinking about this whole concept of listening. You know, we listen a lot. Uh, we listen, we've got, we've got earbuds, we've got headphones, we've got noise-canceling headphones, we've got Bluetooth speakers. We're listening more than any time in history in that sense. A couple of weeks ago, we were coming back from Tennessee and we stopped at a truck stop. And, um, and we were at Arby's in the truck stop. And, and so after we ordered and waited on our food, I walked into the truck stop. And they had this display, and they had these really cool headphones. They were bone-anchored headphones. And basically what that means is you put the headphones on, and you put them against your bone or your skull rather than in your ear, and you can hear the sound through the headphones. It doesn't go through your ear. It's bone-conducted. It goes directly to your inner ear. Now, I know a little bit about that because I'm deaf in one ear, completely deaf in my right ear. My hearing canal or my eardrum doesn't work, but my inner ear still does work. 
And so a while back, I had had a bone-anchored hearing aid put in. They did a surgery and put a screw in my head, and, and um, I could hear through that, but we had some complications with it, and it had to be taken out. And so I haven't decided they want to do another surgery, and I wasn't feeling that, so I said, let's wait on that. It's been several years, so I wasn't really aware of these bone-anchored hearing devices um, as headphones, and I saw these, and I thought, wow, I'm going to try them on. So I put them on, and they sit right on your temple, and all of a sudden, I was hearing in stereo again. All the time, I hear just from one ear, and all of a sudden, I'm hearing from both. And I was so excited, so I called Amy. I said, come here, you got to see this, you got to see this. And so she comes in, and I put them on her, and she looks at me like, whatever. Because she's used to hearing out of both ears. It didn't make a bit of difference for her. That's how she always hears. But for me, it was so exciting to hear the fullness of what was being, um, what, what was the sound that was coming out of it. And so I've ordered me a set, and um, I love uh, my new um, hearing devices. But, but I was thinking about this idea of listening and how we listen to music, we listen to podcasts. Um, wherever you are, if you're on public transit, people have got their earbuds in. People are always listening. But here's a really important question for us. We're listening, or we're hearing, but are we understanding? Are we receiving? Are we listening in a way that it transforms our life? Somebody said these, this word, they said that we are swimming in a sea of words while listening to very few of them. We're hearing, but are we hearing in our heart? One of the interesting things about languages is that in the English language, we have about 100,000 words. 100,000 words. In Hebrew, they have 8,000. And so basically... In the Hebrew language, one word has much more depth to the meaning than what we're really familiar with. So the word Shema is the word to hear, but it's far more than that. It is to perceive sound, but it's also, it's also um, connected to the understanding and responding. And so it's important to understand when you hear this word, the Shema, to hear, what it's talking about is listening and obeying. What God was saying to the people of Israel is, I need you to hear and obey. I'm about to give you some truths from the word of God. I'm about to give you some direction in your walk with the Lord. I'm about to show you the way to the promised land, but I need you to hear. I need you to listen and obey. In Luke's gospel, Jesus quotes the Shema. And he quotes the Shema because a lawyer asked him a question. The lawyer asked him this question. What shall I do to have eternal life? And Jesus' response was, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. Jesus' response to that question was to listen and obey the word of God. What he's saying is, listen, enter the way of Christ. Enter through the person of Jesus Christ. And when you enter, walk in the way of the Lord. And so we need to listen and obey. But not only that, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We also need to make every step through truth. We need to filter our lives through truth. We need to listen, but what are we listening to? He says, listen, the Lord our God is the Lord, the Lord is one. The foundation of our life is that God is the Lord and he alone is Lord. There is no other God in our life. If you were to flip back to Deuteronomy chapter 5, what you would find is the Ten Commandments. And so this, this instruction, this Shema, comes right after the Ten Commandments. What's the first commandment? I am the Lord your God, and you shall have no other God. What's the second commandment? You shall, have no, you shall make no graven images or bow down to any other God. And so God is saying to us, to the people of Israel, to the people who follow him, listen and obey, and everything needs to be filtered through the truth. 
that we serve God and God alone and no other God. Every decision that we make on the journey has to be filtered through that idea. Why was that important? Because the Israelites were about to go into the promised land. And go back and read Joshua and Judges and, and the subsequent books. And what you'll find out is when they went into the promised land, there were many other gods. We're very familiar with the god Baal or the god Molech. And there were other uh, diviners and evil spirits and evil teachers. And, and, and God knew that. And so God said to them, when you go in the promised land, remember that you have one God and one God alone. There is no other God but Yahweh. There is no other Lord in our life but Jesus Christ. And when we think about re-entering society, going back to work, going back to our relationships, we need to realize that the enemy is all around. And before you know it, he'll creep right back in. And what God is saying to us is as you re-enter society, remember that God alone is the Lord of our life. When I was growing up in Liberia, I had many friends from different places who followed after different gods. And one home in particular, I remember visiting their home um, because they had this, this shelf, this bookshelf of, of little gods. Literally, they had little um, statues and, and, and little shrines and and, and like they had 20 or 30 gods on this shelf and they prayed to those gods. They, this was their God. And then they had images on the wall that were reflective of some of their spiritual reality. And I remember going to that home and I, and I walked out feeling uncomfortable, feeling very weird. I'd never really encountered that before. And like they were praying to all of these little statues. If you walked into their home, you would think that's pretty bizarre. That's pretty weird that they're praying to these little statues and, and little shrines in their home. But I wonder, what do those people think when they walk into our home? Do, do they get the sense that Yahweh is on the throne of our home? That there is one God and one God alone? Or do they look around at our materialism and our, all of our, our self-centered things and, and the things that we spend our money on, our sports and our entertainment? Do they walk into our home and see a lot of cultural gods, but they don't see Christ on the throne of our home? That's the challenge for us is to recognize that, that we see other people following gods and we think that's, that's kind of weird and crazy, but in our own life, sometimes our lives are filled with little gods. And if we are going to reconfigure, reboot, or restart our walk with the Lord, we need to look in there and clean out those things that are in improper places. We need to remove those things that take the place of God. Because when you go back into your routine, the creeping effect starts right away. The gods of the world start creeping right back in, into our lives, into our homes, but into our hearts. And we need to be careful, we need to be prayed of, and we need to know, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The path I am choosing is the way of Christ. The path I have chosen is the way of Christ. And therefore, my filter is that there is one God, and he demands my allegiance in everything. Every decision I make, the big decisions about who I marry, the little decisions about where I'm going today, what I'm watching on TV, what I say, they need to be filtered through our relationship with Jesus Christ. And that listening device, those bone-anchored hearing aids, that's the Holy Spirit. We need to hear from the Lord through His Word, but we need to let the Holy Spirit guide us John chapter 14 says the Holy Spirit is our guide. He's our helper. He's the one that guides us in the way. And so we walk in the way of Christ. One of the verses I've recently discovered that I really hadn't learned before was Isaiah 30, 21. Here's what it says. And your ears shall hear a word behind you. Your ears shall hear a word behind you. There's a voice behind you speaking. And here's what it says. This is the way. Walk in it. You're listening to the Holy Spirit and that voice of the Holy Spirit from the Word of God and it's saying to us, this is the way. Don't turn to the right or to the left, but walk in it. Walk in the way of Christ 
and see where he will lead you. Matthew chapter 17 has a very interesting um, story of Jesus' life. It's, it's called the transfiguration. So Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, and he goes up on top of a mountain. And while they're on the top of the mountain, this cloud, this bright cloud comes over them. And in the middle of that brightness and that cloud, all of a sudden, it's not just Jesus, but there's Moses and Elijah. Jesus is transfigured, Moses and Elijah are transfigured, and they're there relating to one another. And Peter and James and John are watching, and it, and it kind of freaks Peter out. Peter realizes that this is a God moment, but he doesn't understand it. And so Peter says, let's build three tabernacles right here. Let's build three altars. And while Peter is talking, here's what Matthew 17 says. He was still speaking when behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said this, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. You remember that from Jesus' baptism when God spoke um, out of the heavens and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. But Matthew 17 has it a little different. If you read Matthew 17, 5, it says, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. And it adds a phrase. It says, listen to him. Listen and obey. Listen and walk in the path of this one. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. At the beginning of the passage in verse 3, it tells us the promise of the Shema. It tells us the promise before it tells us the Shema. It says, Hear, O Israel, um, the Lord is one. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. It tells us what to do, how to, how to walk, who to trust. But before that, it says, If you walk in the way of the Lord, if you keep the Lord in your heart, it will go well with you. He will bless you. He will walk with you. He will make your path straight. But we must walk in the way of the Lord. I wonder this morning, are you listening to the Spirit? Are you spending time in the Word? I know that our schedules have been all disrupted but we can't disrupt our time with the Lord, our time listening, our time hearing. And then when we hear, what do I need to do with what I've heard? Am I listening to the Lord? Am I walking in the way of the Lord? And my challenge to you this morning is to begin to rediscover that walk with the Lord. Begin to rediscover that love for Jesus that maybe you once had. Come back to that healthy relationship where you are dependent on the Lord and you would say, the Lord is my God and there is only one God in my life. And this morning, that's my prayer for you, that you would find the way of the Lord. The Bible says the gate is narrow and few enter it and the road is, is difficult, but it leads to eternal life. And my prayer is that you would find yourself on the way of the cross, on the way of Christ, walking, listening, and obeying his word. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, remind us to listen. Remind us to listen to your voice and not be overwhelmed by anxiety or the fear of this world. Remind us as we enter into the promised land, the land of giants, that you are greater than all of those giants. Remind us that in our homes, there must only be one God. And that one God is Jesus Christ. Father, remind us that every decision we make, who we talk to, what we say, the jobs we do, the person that we date or marry, whatever it is, the decisions that we're making, remind us to filter them through our allegiance and commitment to Jesus Christ. Help us to listen, to listen and obey. In your precious name we pray, amen. Let's continue our time of worship. So as you walk in the way, I hope you will be able to count on this one thing. 
that our Lord God will never fail. talk to you and pray with you on the phone. If you need to do a drive through prayer, I'll meet you up here and we can keep social distancing and I'll pray for you. And if you need some counsel, we'll be glad to do that. But we want you to know that we love you and we're praying for you. And we know that God is at work in your life. It's in times like this that we are salt and light in our community. People can see Christ in us. And so trust the Lord. Have only one God and let him be known in your neighborhood. Thank you for being with us. May God bless you. And I hope that you have a good week in the Lord. Father, we pray that as we leave this place and go out into the world, that you would use us for your glory and speak through us. 
and let our light shine so that other people would know, not us, but that you are Lord and you are Lord alone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. May God bless you and have a good afternoon.